Hello, Luke here with the law firm of Nichols and Green, and I'm going to tell you some of the things you need to know about defending yourself in traffic court. Now, not everyone can afford to hire a traffic attorney, and not every case requires a traffic attorney. Sometimes it just makes sense to go in and try to defend yourself. So when that situation happens, here's some tips that are going to help you out, help things go a little bit smoother, and help increase your chances of being successful. When you get a summons or a traffic ticket, there usually is a description that says the name of the offense you're accused of committing and a code section. Go and look that code section up and read the actual law. A lot of people don't understand what they've been accused of doing. They kind of understand it vaguely, but they don't really know what the requirements of the law are. Read it. Find out whether or not that's what you did and then prepare arguments and defenses about that law. You see this problem a lot with reckless driving by speed. Um, somebody gets charged with reckless driving when all they were doing was driving 78 and a 55. Okay? And nobody else was around, there's no weaving, they were swerving, they weren't being dangerous. And they're like, I wasn't being reckless. And they go to court and they spend all this time arguing with the judge about how they weren't being reckless. But if they read the law and looked up 46.2-862, they would see that the name reckless driving is a bit of a misnomer. The crime has really nothing to do with whether you're driving recklessly or not. What it has to do with is how fast you're driving. Anyone going more than 20 over the speed limit is guilty of reckless driving. That's what the law says. So you've got to read the law and not just look at the title of the law to know what you're accused of. Almost every traffic attorney I know, including myself and my law partner, we do free consultations. So call a traffic attorney and get a free consultation before you decide to go and represent yourself. You never know when we might be able to offer you some helpful tips or advice, or when you're facing a more serious charge than you originally thought. For instance, reckless driving by speed. Uh, a lot of people think they've just got a speeding ticket, and then lo and behold, when they go to court, it turns out it's a criminal offense that goes on their permanent criminal record. So it's a lot more serious than they thought, and because they're not lawyers, they didn't understand Virginia's weird traffic laws. So call an attorney for a free consultation to get some tips and advice, and to help avoid dangers and uh, common booby traps. If you want to fight your case but you can't show up to court, write a letter instead. A lot of courts with minor traffic infractions will allow you to do trial by letter. What you do is you write a letter and include any proof you have and send it to the court. The clerks will include it in the file and when the judge calls your case, they'll see it, read it briefly, and make a decision. This works best with minor fix-it tickets, like window tint violations, broken tail lights, uh, expired registration, thing like that, things like that. Go and get it fixed, get proof that you've gotten it fixed, either a photograph of the car that's all repaired, uh, a receipt from the mechanic shop, uh, a copy of the past inspection, whatever it is, send a copy of that to the court with a brief letter saying, I'm sorry I did this, this is why I was expired, I got it fixed, you know, please dismiss the charge. Send something like that in. A lot of judges, when they see the proof and they see the letter, they'll go ahead and dismiss it on your court date, sometimes with court costs, sometimes without. So if you can't make it to court, instead of just not showing up or prepaying it, try sending in a letter instead. Don't leave your evidence in your car. Don't leave your evidence on your phone. Most courts won't let you bring your phone into court. So if you show up to court and you're like, oh, I got it on my phone, tough luck, okay? Um, the judge isn't going to stop the trial to let you run back out to your car to go get something. So make sure you bring everything you need to the podium. You have all your evidence right there and you have it in a format that the court can see. Okay? If you've got it on a phone and they won't let you bring it in the phone, eh, it's out of luck. So you know, print stuff off. Have hard copies. That's the safest way to do it. Find out whether your case will be assigned a prosecutor. In Virginia, not every county assigns prosecutors to traffic infractions. Some counties only assign prosecutors to traffic tickets if an attorney uh, is representing the defendant. So it really depends. Each county does it their own way. Each state does it their own way. Sometimes the officer can act as a prosecutor and sometimes they don't. So call up the clerk's office, call up the prosecutor's office in your county, find out whether or not your case will have a prosecutor and find out whether or not you can negotiate with the police officer then find out when that prosecutor will be assigned to your case. In Fairfax County, for instance, prosecutors are assigned to the case the morning of trial. So there's nobody to talk to prior to trial. You go to some of the rural counties in Virginia, they assign prosecutors in advance or they have kind of a, a wild card prosecutor that you can call any time to negotiate. 
So call the prosecutor's office, find out if there's somebody to negotiate with, and when you can negotiate with them. Negotiating with a prosecutor usually doesn't have any downsides because if you don't like what the prosecutor has to say, if you don't like what they're offering you, you can always reject their offer and take your case straight to the judge. So you're not really losing anything by negotiating with the prosecutor, but you are gaining one opportunity to convince somebody to give you what you want. A lot of people try to play the continuance game. They try to get lots of continuances to see if the officer won't show up. This works in some jurisdictions and it doesn't work in others. It doesn't really work well in Virginia because in Virginia, each officer is assigned a court date, one court date per month or one court date every two months, and all of the cases that they have are prosecuted on that day. So if an officer goes out and writes 150 tickets throughout the month, they show up to court and they prosecute all 150 tickets on that month. What this means then is that the officer has to show up to that court date or a month's worth of work or two months worth of work goes down the drain. So there's a lot of incentives for officers not to just not show up. Additionally, in Virginia, you can be held in contempt of court for not showing up. If an attorney doesn't show up, if a witness doesn't show up, if a police officer doesn't show up, these people can be held in contempt of court. And I've seen officers be issued warrants for contempt of court for failing to show up on a case. It's a very serious uh, matter. Uh, additionally, police officers can lose their jobs or they can be sanctioned or they can have serious repercussions on their careers if they simply blow off court dates. If an officer is sick or injured or involved in an accident or delayed because of uh, police duties, they'll call the court or their supervisor will call the court and their cases will simply get continued to the next court date. Really the only time you see officers not showing up and their cases being dismissed is when they leave the police force. And that only happens in very rare cases. So less than 1% of the time does uh, simply uh, the officer not showing up ever affect the outcome of a case in Virginia. In other states that might be a, a, a thing that works, but not so much here in Virginia. It's really common for the information on people's summons to contain typos or errors. You'll get into court and your name is spelled wrong on your ticket, or your date of birth is wrong, or your driver's license number is wrong. Don't correct this. Um, don't feel a need to tell the court, oh, you spelled my name wrong, you got my date of birth wrong, you got my license number wrong. Um, the reason why is this information, that information is how the DMV knows whose record to put that ticket. So if the officer or the clerk or somebody writes my name down wrong, my date of birth wrong, or my driver's license number wrong on the ticket or in my court information and I get convicted of that ticket, that information is sent to the DMV and the DMV uses that information to try to figure out whose DMV record that information goes on. Well, I don't want it on my DMV record, so why would I correct them to help them more effectively find my record? If they typo my name bad enough or they typo my driver's license number bad enough, they may not be able to go and put it on my DMV record. And that happens every once in a while. So if you see an error on there, it's not a defense. It's not going to, in fact, your name spelled wrong isn't going to get your case dismissed. The judge isn't going to make any hay out of it. They're just going to correct it. And then your ticket's going to go on your record that much easier. So don't uh, get hung up on that sort of thing. A lot of people come into court and ask the judge to do something that they do not have the legal authority to do. Um, so don't waste your time and energy doing that. Find out what they can do and then ask them to do that. Okay? So for instance, in Maryland, judges sometimes have the power to be able to decide how many points come with a given ticket. Virginia, they do not have that authority. The judge has no control over how many points you get for a given ticket. So don't ask them, it just annoys them. They hear it all the time and you know, it just doesn't do any good. Additionally, certain tickets come with mandatory punishments. So if you have an HOV ticket, there are mandatory fines. Your first offense is $125, your second offense is $250, your third offense is $500. The judge doesn't have a choice. That's what the law says they have to do. So if you want the judge to do something for you, you have to ask him to do something that they have the power and authority to do. So read the law ask around, talk to the clerk's office, talk to an attorney, find out what the judges can and can't do. If you're going to try to quote case law or statutes, make sure you print it off and bring it to court. Uh, judges don't have every law memorized, they don't have every case memorized, and if you're going to present them something new, make sure you print it off so that they can read it themselves. They're not going to just take your word for it or take your interpretation for it. 
And additionally, they're in a hurry, so they can't stop and do all this legal research while there's 150 people waiting to have their case heard in the same court. So print off what you have, bring it with you to the podium, and if you're going to quote a statute or a case law, hand it up to the court and say, here, I brought printed off the case. Please take a, a look at this, and you'll see that this case says this, and I think because of that case, my case should be dismissed. So make sure you print it off. If you're going to quote case law, if you're going to try to read the law and bring laws to court, make sure you understand which laws control your judge's decisions and which laws do not. Which cases control his decision making process and which ones do not. For instance, here in Virginia, Ohio statutes are irrelevant and Ohio court decisions are irrelevant. So if you come here with a court case from Ohio, no one cares. This ain't Ohio. If you come in with a federal court case, most of the time, those are irrelevant too, unless they're dealing with constitutional issues or some special exceptions. You've got to make sure you have the laws that govern in this particular situation. Additionally, published cases control, unpublished cases do not. So don't come in with an unpublished case and try to argue that it's a law. Don't come in with legal treatises or books written by lawyers. Those things don't govern either. So, if you're going to come in with cases and statutes, make sure you understand which ones control the judge's decision-making process and which ones do not, and come with the right ones. Make sure your behavior and your appearance support your arguments. If you want the judge to believe you're a responsible citizen, you're an honest witness, you're a good driver, dress the part, act the part. If you come in really aggressive, if you come in uh, making blanket accusations against the officer, that sort of thing turns people off and makes them think, wow, they're really wound up. They'll, they'll say anything to get out of this case. Um, so keep calm, keep professional, dress up uh, nicely, or it doesn't have to be fancy, it doesn't even have to be a suit and tie, but just you know, present yourself well. And uh, that goes a long way. Um, wearing a suit and tie or dressing up won't make you win your case. But if you dress trashy, if you act rudely, if you don't uh, take it seriously, that can certainly cost you your case. Never lie to the court. If you can't tell the truth, exercise your right to remain silent, but never lie. Don't try to fudge things, don't try to exaggerate. Tell it how it is, and if the truth hurts you, keep your mouth shut. Uh, I can't tell you how many times people have ruined their case because they tried to fudge or exaggerate about something little the judge caught them, and then he thought they're a liar, and they disregarded all their other testimony. So just tell the truth, tell it like it is, don't exaggerate. Understand how trials proceed, okay? A lot of people get confused and they get in arguments with the judges because they don't understand how trials work, okay? In Virginia, the way a basic trial works is the prosecutor or officer gets to speak first. They tell their story then you get an opportunity to ask them questions, but only ask them questions. You can't make statements, just get to ask them questions. After you're done asking them questions, then you get a chance to tell your story, and the prosecutor or the officer gets to ask you questions. Once that's done, the judge decides whether you're innocent or guilty, and then they move on to the sentencing phase. This is where you talk about things that don't have any bearing on whether you're guilty, but affect how serious or, or harsh your punishment should be. So that's when the mitigating evidence comes in. And first the prosecutor or officer gets to speak, and then you get to speak. The biggest, the most common way people irritate the judge is by trying to explain things when they're supposed to just be asking questions, or when it's the other person's turn to talk. Understanding how we take turns in a trial is important just to keeping on the good side of the judge. Get to the point quickly. Traffic court moves quickly. The judges don't have a lot of time to deal with any one case. Fairfax County, for instance, a single judge may have to hear 200 cases in three to four hours. That's seconds per case. So if you think a judge is gonna spend 15 minutes listening to your defense, that's not gonna happen. Make sure that you can say everything you wanna say in seconds, not minutes. Before going and standing up in front of the judge, write down what you wanna say. Put it on a little note card, on a piece of paper, have it there so you can either read straight off it or use it to keep yourself on point. Don't be afraid to do it. This isn't drama club, it's not theater. Uh, the important thing is communicating quickly and effectively. And if having notes and writing down what you wanna say helps you do that, that's great, do it. Understand the difference between mitigating evidence 
and a defense. A defense is an evidence or argument that you're innocent. Mitigating evidence is an argument that even though you're guilty, you shouldn't be punished harshly. You should be shown mercy. Defenses happen during the trial. Mitigating evidence happens during sentencing. Common problem is people who are representing themselves get the two confused and they start offering mitigating evidence during the trial and they offer defenses during sentencing. Don't do that. So here's a really common example. Uh, arguing that the officer's uh, radar isn't calibrated, that's a defense, okay? That should be brought up during trial, not after you're found guilty. Um, evidence that your speedometer is inaccurate, so you didn't realize you were speeding, that's mitigating evidence, not a defense. You're admitting you're guilty, but you're trying to explain why uh, you didn't mean to do it, why you shouldn't be punished for doing it. That should come up during sentencing. In the state of Virginia, there's only a handful of pleas you can do. There's guilty, not guilty, no contest, and there's guilty with explanation. Pleading no contest or no contendere is essentially the exact same thing as a guilty plea in the state of Virginia. In other states, there's an important legal significance between no contest and a guilty plea, but not so in Virginia. It's all the same thing. If you plead guilty, but you want to explain why you should be punished uh, lightly or you have some explanation of why you'd like the judge to still not find you guilty even though you are guilty, then you say, I'm pleading guilty with an explanation. And the judge will let you explain what mitigating evidence you have. But the important thing to remember is if you plead guilty, you're not going to have a trial. The judge is not going to hear defenses. Okay? If you want to offer defenses, if you want to explain why you are not guilty, make sure you plead not guilty. In most places in Virginia and a lot of other states as well, if there's an accident case or there's a case that involves witnesses, your trial may not be at the first court date. It's a very common practice here in Virginia for the first trial date to simply be a hearing. They don't subpoena the witnesses, they don't inconvenience the civilians and witnesses by bringing them to court when 90% of the cases work themselves out. So what they do is the first court date, they come to court, they ask you what you're going to plead, and if you plead not guilty, they say, okay, they give you a continuance, they set a new date, and then they bring the witnesses. So if you were involved in a car accident and ticketed because of that, if the prosecution or the police officer is going to be bringing witnesses to court, there's a really good chance that your first court date is not a trial date, and that if you plead not guilty, they're going to make you come back to court another day to have your trial. So if you want to know if that's the case in your situation, call the clerk's office and ask them whether witnesses are going to be subpoenaed on that first court date. Hopefully these tips and suggestions have been helpful, but if you have a ticket or a criminal offense in Northern Virginia and you would like some free consultation, some free advice, give us a call. We're happy to talk to you, happy to help out. Thanks for watching and have a good day.